Hey, Michael, how are you? Excellent. Very well, very well. How are you? Oh. Come see, come sir. Pretty good at the majority. Pretty good. <laughs> so, hello everyone. Welcome to uh, another data science webinar. We're still a few minutes away. Got another three, three, another five minutes before we'll start. So, still got people coming in. So, we'll uh, just hold tight. Then you can. While you're waiting, you can see what Michael's been reading on his bookshelf. <laughs> if you interested? have really, really yeah. keen eyesight, and uh, <laughs> if my if my uh, camera were only a bit better. Anything interesting? Not really. I've no. started reading. I've started reading for uh, for my daughter. Started reading oh. her Treasure Island. Oh. So you got. Uh, a, uh, a Robert Louis Stevenson among all of the uh, technical books. Well, which ones does she prefer, Treasure Island or uh, Neural Network Theory? <laughs> <laughs> well, she likes she likes Neural Network practice. <laughs> well, of course, we, we all should keep our brains working. Mm -hmm. Now then, yeah, so... So it's two or three minutes before our official start time. But I'll, I'll, what I'll do, I'll just I'll mute myself for a couple of minutes, or or, or we can do we can do idle chit chat if you want. Well, <laughs> either way, either way, <laughs> is my uh, uh, screen? Uh, yeah, yeah, every, probably. Everything looks fine. Everything Good. looks fine. We've got eighteen participants at the moment, so still still a few minutes away from the official start time. I've tidied up my office for you today. It was restuck the map back on the on the door. <laughs> that's uh, that, that's what uh, video conferences are for. They're an incentive. That's right. I'm really looking really looking forward to this talk. So be eye opening, I think. Should, I hope so. I hope should, so. Be, should we all be worried? That's the question. Uh, more, more worried. <laughs> more. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I spent I spent so much time uh, preparing this talk, mainly in order to uh, decide what not to present, because there's just so much material and it's uh, right. so so fantastic, all of it. Yeah. Okay, you got a message from Martin. Hi, Michael. Good to see you again. Excited to learn from you. So, okay, what we'll do, guys, uh, we're officially on 12.30, kind of, so everyone, sh everyone should be joining straight away. So what we're going to be doing is, we'll, I think we're probably all familiar with the Q&A on Zoom and the chat. So... As we go along, if you've got any uh, questions, uh, just use the chat facility on, on Zoom. Uh, sorry, not the chat facility, the question and answer facility. Uh, and if, there's, if there's been a question asked that kind of you like and you want to kind of vote it, I think you can like give the question a thumbs up. Uh, and we've also got the chat facility if you, you want to say hello. So I could say, hello, all. Where are you from? So I've sent a message to you all. Uh, if you can, uh, if you're interested, if you can hear us, give us a bit of a response, and we know we're not just talking to ourselves. That'd be nice. Come on, you can do it. Say hello, to someone. <laughs> Okay, we're at, right. Okay, so, attendees have begun. So, 31 attendees. Uh, people 30. are responding to your call. Oh, video good, audio good. Thanks, Oak. Hi, Nick, Nick. Hi, Nick from Melbourne. This is, this is known in the, in the industry as Chatterbait. Pamela, can you <laughs> 
I feel long time no see. A long, that's a long time since I've seen anyone, to be honest, Richard. It's been good to uh, see you all back in the flesh after Christmas, hopefully. Uh, okay, so I'll shoot, we'll get started. To, we'll get started in a minute, but first of all, uh, as usual, I'd just like to thank all our sponsors. So this is the, the, the names you see up there are all people who, who make these events possible. Uh, and, you know, without, without that support, it, it just these things just won't be happen, won't happen. So please, a uh, big round of applause for all our sponsors. Really. <laughs> uh, so I'll get started now. Oh, good day from Adelaide. Oh, I've got someone from Adelaide. Excellent. Uh, Sabia from Melbourne. Well done. Okay. Right. Okay. We'll get started now. I think we've got a uh, most problems. I've got two screens and my mouse. Use it. I've got to kind of zoom it across at a particular speed to get it to the other screen. Oh, there we go. Right. So, without any further ado, we'll get we'll get on with our talk. Uh, welcome everyone. So, for those of you who don't know Michael uh, and are part of the data science group, you've you've got a lot to thank Michael for because he was when he, in his days when he was with Monash, he he really got behind the group and they've been a kind of sponsor of, of the group ever since and it was michael who kind of initiated that uh and he's gonna i'm really looking forward to this talk today uh as i was saying to michael earlier i don't know whether to be worried or, or more worried about the content but, but we'll, we'll soon find out so i'll uh hand you over to michael so welcome michael and uh looking forward to a great presentation Thanks, Phil. Um, so, hi, I'm uh, Michael Brand, and uh, thanks for joining this talk about uh, Facebook and election influence. A bit of background. So, as uh, some of you will have already heard, I uh, have been a data scientist for about 25 years now, probably a bit more. And two years ago, I started a data science consultancy called Otsma Analytics that deals with strategic data science, which is the kind of data science that makes a qualitative change. And the subject matter of this talk certainly qualifies. And I do meta research, which means that I analyze other people's analyses. And usually that's uh, in order to stress test them. Some of you have heard me do that in uh, other talks of mine. Uh, in this particular talk, I'm not going to stress test any research. What I'm going to do is I'm going to connect the dots between many different uh, researchers. What do I never do is politics. And this, this talk, if you were expecting uh, to hear political opinions, you're gonna be disappointed. This talk is just going to be about research and data. And I'm gonna to try to present the facts as evenly as I can. Um, if, you're, if, you, if you were going to uh, post your political opinions on the chat or in Q and A, I've, I've asked uh, Phil to be very vigilant about uh, not allowing that. So please don't. So first question is, why am I picking on Facebook? Why am I singling Facebook uh, out? Why not speak about social media in general? This is a question I was asked recently in an uh, ABC News interview, and I think it's a wonderful question. So let me start on that. It's because they're the biggest bully in the yard. They are, the, the number one consumer of our online time investment, one eighth of our total time, completely uh, off the charts from anything else. Um, they have over a third of the planet's population as their monthly active users. That's just an outlandish number. These are people who do not have running water that have Facebook. Contrary to popular opinion, people do read their news on Facebook. 43% of Americans read their news on Facebook. That is more than twice the nearest competitor. They've got incredibly deep pockets. We'll talk more about that later on, but in the last four quarters, they had over $75 billion of revenue. That number keeps going up. Two thirds of that 
goes back to operating costs. And I, I just want to point out when that's your operating cost over $50 billion, this pays for a whole lot of data scientists and social psychologists and behavioral economists and persuasion technologists and addiction specialists and engineers and artists and the 50,000 plus other employees of Facebook. And you will still have left to pay for a few billionaires. So on top of that, they also have a very, very bad and draconian uh, terms of service that allows them to do pretty much everything they want. It's a 200 page document that you guys did not read. And uh, just to summarize, this is not my summarization. This is legal scholars having looked at it. Facebook can use any of your stuff for any reason they want without paying you for advertising in particular. And um, the rating that uh, site uh, TOSDR gives uh, Facebook's terms of service is a class E. They have a, a rating A through E. E is the worst. E means the terms of service raise very serious concerns. And as you can see, there are a whole lot of uh, no-goes uh, on, on this class E. There are a whole lot of no-nos and not a single thumbs up on anything that they do. And if you think that, oh, well, that's just the industry, everybody does that, the answer is uh, no. So obviously you, you were expecting probably DuckDuckGo to be a class A and Wikipedia class B shouldn't surprise anyone. But Google and Amazon are both uh, class C and Facebook's most direct competitors, YouTube and Twitter are both class D. Facebook is certainly a standout with just how bad their terms of service are. Next up, they have a really, really bad history with ethics. People sometimes ask me, you know, when did this start? When did Facebook start uh, um, with these ethical problems that they seem to have every five minutes? And the answer is in the first five minutes. This is uh, an IM exchange uh, between Mark Zuckerberg and a college friend months after um, Facebook was launched. I'm not going to read it out to you. I've self-censored it here uh, because I, uh, I don't like profanities, uh, but you, you get the picture. Next up, it is an immersive environment that is geared to sell. And I'm going to quote Jeff Hammerbacker here, who was one of the co-founders of Facebook. The best minds of my generation are thinking about how to make people click ads. That sucks. And I'm sure when he said that, what he meant was that these people could be curing cancer. But I think uh, equally bad is the fact that when you have the best minds of a generation thinking about how to persuade people, then you're going to end up with a super weapon for, for persuasion. And that's exactly what they did. They built an, a laboratory that gives not just ideal laboratory conditions, but also maximum influence ability. And uh, you, know, you can look at all of the various aspects of what you would want from such an ideal uh, environment and you can tick mark Facebook all along the line. Let's begin with some common misconceptions because when I, when I tell people about Facebook, they usually start off by thinking, well, that doesn't apply to me. Well, it does, it does really, because if you think only stupid people can be influenced like that, well, no. These are universal cognitive biases. You can read up on them and everybody is influenced by them. And if you think that if you know they're doing it to you, you can ignore it. No, they're pre-attentive reactions. They're uncontrollable. I recommend watching uh, The Social Dilemma on Netflix where you will be able to see lots of the people who design these systems say that they themselves can't escape their, their influence. The other kind of objection that I sometimes hear is people telling me that they've looked at Facebook, they know what Facebook is, and it's not all of the things I describe it to be. And that's because you're looking at your own feed, but your own feed is 100% personalized, and it's completely unlike what anybody else sees. So you cannot in any way make extrapolations based on it. So with those things in place, Let's talk about the basic data science of Facebook influence. And we're going to start with the things that you do in data science everywhere. So that's not going to surprise you. The first thing that you do is you gather data. 
As an example, uh, Trump's 2016 campaign built a database that they called Project Alamo, and it contained detailed identity profiles on pretty much every voter in America. They purchased data from uh, certified Facebook marketing partners, that's Experian and Datalogix and Epsilon and Axiom. Um, so they had finance data, purchase data, uh, demographics, age, religion, you name it. And also they had Cambridge Analytica um, psychographic data. By the way, if, if you think that uh, Cambridge Analytica is any less ethical uh, then the rest, no, they're all equally unethical. And if you are wondering whether Cambridge Analytica is any less legal than the rest, nope, they're equally all legal. Um, I'm, I don't have uh, time in one hour to go into the Cambridge Analytica scandal, but it's very interesting stuff. Um, on top of all of these things, they used lookalike hyper-targeting, which Facebook uh, just provides uh, out of the box and they use that to uh, bootstrap the campaign. And altogether, these are tens of thousands of attributes per person in America, so per voter in America. Uh, the Cambridge Analytica data alone is about 5,000 uh, attributes. Axiom is another 11,000 and so forth. Next thing that you want is to use that data in order to segment or map your population in meaningful ways. And in 2013, Kaczynski et al., so Michal Kaczynski et al., uh, published this paper called Private Traits and Attributes are Predictable from Digital Records of Human Behavior. Digital Records of Human Behavior is codenamed for Facebook likes. They just used likes, and they used a handful of likes at that. They, they had something like an average of 50 likes per person that they looked at. And what they were able to do with those likes was to predict with amazing areas under the curve and amazing uh, correlation coefficients, sexual orientation, ethnicity, religious and political views, personality traits, intelligence, happiness, use of addictive substances, parental separation, age, gender, you name it. And this is just from a handful of likes. This is just from likes that almost invariably had nothing to do with any of the things that um, were being predicted. And that's only a fraction of the data that I mentioned before um, that was used in political campaigns. And that is in turn only a very, very small fraction of the gigabytes over gigabytes of data that Mark Zuckerberg has uh, over each and every user. Now, you might think that in order to get these excellent AUCs and, and coefficients, they had to use some incredibly sophisticated AI. They did not. Uh, what they did was they just took the likes, put uh, them in SVD in order to uh, uh, reduce the dimensionality to 100, and then use logistic regression and linear regression as may be the case. That's it. That's probably the simplest model you're ever going to see in production. And that's what it does. And they still have an online version of it in case you want to check uh, uh, how well it does for you. Okay, so you did that. And now you can start experimenting because you want to look at how various demographics are impacted by various stimuli so that you'll know how to optimize them. And when we think about uh, data science, we generally think about marketing. So all the people who want to sell you shampoos and uh, whatnot. But in, in fact, data science for political purposes came first. In 1959, the Simulmatics Corporation was already doing political data science. This is a year before Peter Noor ever coined the phrase data science to begin with. And even back then, it was considered a threat to democracy. Let's talk about some of the experiments that Facebook has been doing. So in 2010, uh, they had a, an experiment, which is what really got me interested in this subject, called the voter megaphone. They had this little button. This is what it looked like. 
uh, that said about all of these people in the picture that they voted and encouraged you to click if you voted. And um, by the way, just being able to use your picture in this way is one of the many no-goes uh, that uh, the Facebook Terms of Service has. So they did that and they learned that they can impact voter turnout just by having this button and uh, how much they impacted it depended very much on the details of the button, specifically on which pictures they were showing, which of your friends, because some friends are more persuasive than others. And they did that on 61 million users and managed to boost voting by 340,000 votes, way more than enough to determine a, a president in the US. And they've been using it in every election uh, ever since in the US and in many other places besides. Two years later, uh, a different political uh, experiment, they um, changed the amount of political content in news feeds. And they've done that for 1.9 million users. And what they showed is that it wasn't just online behavior that is uh, being impacted by, uh, by the news feed, it's also offline behavior voting percentages actually rose by, by full percents uh, very dramatically. Again, more than enough to determine an election in the US. So those were uh, experiments about how to optimize stimuli. Here's where it gets more interesting because in social media, you don't just blindly try to influence everyone. You very judiciously target the influencers and you want them to influence everybody else. And the first to do that in earnest uh, was uh, Obama's 2008 campaign. And they thought of it as a, as a cost saving device. You know, you touch thousands, you move millions. But what it actually happened was that it gave, that, it gave that campaign a feeling of a grassroots movement. And that was so successful that everybody's been copying it ever since. And the Moral of the story is there's no such thing as grassroots. Whenever you see anybody, you know, the people are, are rising up, no, the, the people have their strings pulled. And this is how that just works. And this is how it looks these days. And as an example of a Facebook experiment to show that in uh, 2014, they had an experiment that they themselves called the emotion contagion experiment almost 700,000 users uh, were given feed that was manipulated on uh, how much or how little uh, happy news and how much and how little sad news you got. And they showed that not only did that impact people's emotional states, it impact the emotional states of their friends. So that is emotional contagion, which they could uh, uh, follow down the graph. By the way, this wasn't a surprise to anyone because if you remember the 2010 um, voter megaphone experiment, I said that 340,000 votes uh, were, were boosted. That is completely true, but only 60,000 of those were by people who actually saw the button. All of the rest was network influence. So on the face of it, uh, Facebook, didn't think there was anything uh, very problematic about this experiment. They even uh, published it in uh, PNAS. They saw it as having a clear business purpose. They, they wanted uh, happy users and Facebook does want happy users, not, not too happy because then they'll you know, go offline and live their life, but just you know, happy enough to keep them clicking. Um, but that didn't fool anyone and um, ethicists were furious uh, by uh, uh, you know, the lack of oversight on this, uh, the, uh, the, the lack of any form of ethical uh, review, no uh, opt-outs and all, all of those. And the larger public was furious about uh, the, the emotional uh, manipulation. But one reaction I want to single out in particular, this was Clay Johnson who said at the time, the Facebook transmission of anger experiment is terrifying. Could Mark Zuckerberg swing an election by promoting upworthy posts two weeks beforehand? Should that be legal? Could the CIA incite revolution in Sudan by pressuring Facebook to promote discontent? 
should that be legal? So the, what I'm trying to say here, the writing was on the wall. Um, Clay Johnson said that in uh, 2014. I was speaking about it in, you know, from 2012 on or so. And by 2015, I already had it as part of my teaching material at Monash. 2016, I was already publishing about this sort of thing. This was pretty obvious to everyone who was uh, looking at it that this was going to be weaponized. The reason why Clay Johnson in particular is interesting is because he uh, was a co-founder for the firm who managed uh, that managed uh, Obama's 2008 campaign. So he was probably the best situated person to make use of this. And instead of saying, oh, look, I've got a shiny new tool that I can uh, make use of, his reaction was, this is going to be weaponized. And indeed it was uh, immediately after. So let's talk about that deception. So short history of, of deception. Um, Propaganda has been around for centuries. Uh, the, the Vatican had an office of propaganda from, from the 14th century. Um, the Russians are usually the ones credited for bringing it to the modern era, and this is part of their active measures. This information is only part of that. At around 2000, they started uh, what they called web brigades. They employed users in order to post um, propaganda as comments on websites. And at around 2012, they looked at what uh, Facebook has been doing with all of these experiments, everything, every, every tool that Facebook has developed and proved, and they said, huh, we can, we can do some computational propaganda. And by 2013, they started the Internet Research Agency, the IRA, which is the troll farm that has been uh, uh, running bot campaigns ever since. And how, how has uh, the uh, IRA been uh, used in election meddling? Well, according to a 2017 analysis, specifically when it comes to election, you can do many things. You can intimidate voters or bribe them or disinform them. You can hack elections, or if you can't hack them, you can create the impression that they've been compromised, which is almost as good. Of course, that was in 2017 and has nothing to do with anything that's going on in 2020. But that's just the house of it. Election meddling is also interesting in terms of the whys of it, because you can have many different aims when you're meddling in elections. You can boost the turnout for your desired candidate. You can suppress other votes. You can split other votes. You can change voters' preferences, or you can sow general confusion and distrust in the elections. And perhaps the entire key for everything that comes after this is the insight that suppressing and splitting is easy, changing voters' preferences is hard. So whereas classically, when you're talking about you know, how politicians used to behave, you would expect, as a, as a citizen, you were expecting politicians to be largely truthful. I'm not gonna you know, put too fine a point on that. Largely truthful and try to persuade you to vote for them. And that is simply going down the hardest path. And politicians have simply started being um, data-driven ever since. And in recent years, they've been doing the much easier and more cost-effective things in order to win elections. And that is to lie to you and suppress the vote of the people that they don't want to vote for them, which is much, much easier to do. Now, examples of non-politicians, but rather IRA doing that, is um, splitting the democratic vote when uh, the democratic primaries were running. Remember, they, they had a, a great many um, candidates and they boosted Bernie Sanders just in order to get uh, votes away from the likes of Joe Biden. And another example, they've suppressed selected votes. How? through Facebook by having a disinformation campaign that convinced selected populations that they can vote by sending an SMS message. So every, obviously everyone who was convinced by that and simply sent the SMS text message and said, well, here I voted, uh, didn't have their vote counted and that's you know one vote better for, for this election. Um, and, and this is the IRA, to give a political example, uh, the Trump campaign uh, used 
$150 million just in the last few weeks before the 2016 election uh, to, to uh, almost entirely negative ads uh, targeted at uh, suppressing 3.5 million people, reportedly. Okay, so there are a whole lot of moving parts here in terms of the hows and the whys of election meddling and deception uh, at large. And I thought it would be good to use a theoretical model that uh, simplifies all of this a great deal. This is the borden cop model. It was developed in 1999. And again, this was based on what the Russians were already doing at the time. Um, and it shows five ways, really four ways and two variants. The uh, degradation has two variants here uh, of how to perform deception. And the idea is this is a, an information theoretical model and it shows how deception in its various ways impacts your ability to determine the true message. So you can hide the message in noise, that's degradation. You can mimic a real message, that's like fake news, that's called corruption. You can um, just get a person to not ever see the message, that's denial. And uh, you can subvert processing, that is, you can convince a person not to believe the message even if they see it. That's called subversion. And basically, any tool that you can use uh, to deceive, you can use in one of these four different ways. And disinformation campaigns generally um, have a, uh, a multiple of them. They, they, they work on multiple of these dimensions. So for example, Let's look at uh, hyper-targeting. How can I leverage hyper-targeting if I want to deceive using it? Well, what is hyper-targeting? Hyper-targeting means that what I'm seeing is not what other people are seeing. So if another person is getting different facts from Facebook than I get, and because of that, they make choices, those choices will seem completely unreasonable to me because I would never make those choices based on the facts that I have. And that makes me uh, not say, oh, they must be working on, uh, on, on a different set of facts. We're, we're not wired to say that. What we are wired is to say, well, I don't trust that, that person. Their, their judgment doesn't seem sound to me. And once you have that tool, you can very easily break down true communications. And that's corruption you can build distrust between populations and that's subversion. So, you know, once uh, another person speaks to you, they just, you just won't believe them uh, if, they're, if their message doesn't uh, conform, conform with uh, what the uh, deception campaign is about. You can promise different things to different people and you can scare different populations about different things. And that's denial because I don't know what you said to those other people. I don't know what you promised to, to them. I, I don't know how you scared them. And um, this, is, this is not just true, by the way, for the individual users. In Facebook, this is also a problem from the regulator side. Uh, there have been calls uh, that some of Trump's 2016 uh, uh, negative ads did not comply with federal law. And there's just no way to, to check those claims because Facebook refuses to say which ads were run, how many ads were run, who saw which ad. We, we don't know. We do know that uh, uh, ultimately those ads uh, sent people to 100,000 plus different websites with different creative content. Finally, you can just confuse the issue. You can introduce irrelevancies by, by you know, spamming people's uh, feeds with all sorts of noise. Or alternatively, you can get everyone interested in one irrelevancy. And that's uh, the kind of one day rage campaigns that you get to see quite a lot recently with things like uh, um, cancel culture. And that's degradation. So all five, just by looking at hyper-targeting. Now, obviously, that's not the only thing that you can do when you have this uh, extreme ability to personalize. And most uh, famous is the fact that personalization can create echo chambers through uh, filter bubbles. Now, you will have heard these terms, but I still want to go through what they actually mean, because I find that people 
interpret them, interpret them in very different ways. So if there is an opinion spectrum, it has some distribution. But if you are watching that through a, a, a filter bubble, through uh, the algorithm only picking certain things to appear in your newsfeed and not others, you will be getting a very different apparent distribution and it will be a much narrower distribution than the actual distribution. And that's the idea of an echo chamber. They are personalized. Now, originally, um, obviously this uh, was started because Facebook wanted to give you the news you're interested in. But uh, the reason why the algorithms favor this is because of confirmation bias. Because when we hear the things that we a priori agree with, we tend to be happier. That's one of our cognitive biases. And that's one of those things that keeps us clicking. So very good for the original purpose. But once we are in the context of deception, it's been uh, used in two different ways. The first is to manipulate opinions using a false appearance of a consensus as an attractor. What do I mean by that? So let's suppose that my opinion is this circle over here and looking at my feed, I think that the consensus is where the dashed line is. If I could move that simply by changing the filter, my opinion would be dragged along with it because I will feel a uh, psychological need to keep compensating. So you can basically drag any person you want to wherever you want. And this has been used in adversarial uh, ML campaigns by bots, which exploit this by creating a, an actual false consensus, which the, the filter algorithm then learns and follows because these filter algorithms try to do all forms of uh, margin maximization. The other thing that uh, is really useful in terms of deception is to artificially create an us versus them dynamic. Because if you have this narrow view of what the opinion distribution is, and you're suddenly seeing an opinion somewhere where the them is, your, think, your, your thoughts would be, well, that's like 10 sigmas out. There's just absolutely no way that somebody from my tribe would uh, uh, say any of those things. Therefore, that cannot be part of my tribe. That's a them. And I need to protect us from them. And you get uh, uh, people polarized and combative and scared and all of the things that really, really help when you're trying to convince people because nothing makes people more uh, convincible than, uh, than them being scared. Okay, moving on to the next topic. The information theoretic model from 1999 was supplemented in 2018 by a game theoretic layer, where they said it's not just dimensions of uh, deception. You can actually have a compound attack where you first do this and then do that and all those, uh, because you want to just move the victim through a particular path. Perhaps initially you want to create noise so that they'll be less certain of something. And then when they'll see your fake news, they'll be more prone to believe it, that sort of thing. So the victim is in this particular uh, model, a stateful victim. You can think about this as a, as a Markov process. And what they, what they uh, were able to show is that even a very small population of deceivers is enough to overcome the entire wider population around them. And the reason why is because the uh, social media graph is a very uh, small world graph. It has a very low degree of separation. Everybody is a friend of a friend of a friend. So while you might think that uh, your friends are people close to you that you know and uh, trust, a friend of a friend of a friend, just you know, transitively going through that a few times, already is everyone in the world, including all of those bots that are trying to attack, which is why they can, they can do that extremely easily if only they can, just like with the target the influencers uh, portion, just convince the victim to be a proxy for them. So all you need is for your first victim to become a megaphone for your attacks, to start saying the things that otherwise you would want to be saying, and they can convince other people. And again, you only need to touch thousands and they do all of the rest. They convince the millions. 
And this is not just a, a game theoretical analysis. This has been verified experimentally. Lies just spread better on Facebook uh, in just about every metric that was measured. Uh, they, they are faster, they, are, they propagate deeper, they reach 100 times more, more people. It's, it's just scary how much lies are better than truth in this. And it's not really surprising. I mean, if we if we talked before about how the Facebook feed is is addictive, and uh, that's sort of an analogy, uh, uh, trying to portray Facebook as a you know a, a drug pusher of some kind, those who go down the path of uh, uh, deception, they're not just pushing drugs; they're pushing designer drugs. These lies are specifically tailored so that they would maximize their impact and maximize their, their propagatability. So it's really, really not surprising. They have a great advantage compared to truth, which is just truth. It is what it is. And you can see this if, you're, if you look at any modern conspiracy theory. I mean, what you see here in the graph is a, a Google trend graph for uh, flat eartherism. And, and there was just basically no flat eartherism until only a, a few years ago. And suddenly, whoops, it goes up and then it goes down and it looks extremely controlled. So I, I, uh, I'm gonna push my own conspiracy theory here. I think somebody's pulling the strings in all of these conspiracy theories because um, that's a social experiment. That's a social experiment that can tell you how easy it is to propagate this kind of thing. So lies don't always propagate, don't, don't just always propagate better, they also stick better. And I mentioned this friend of a friend of a friend, that's one of the many, many cognitive biases that makes us trust lies when we hear them on Facebook. We think that they're from our friends just because our friends relayed them. Even if our late friends didn't relay them, we hear them from a blended uh, newsfeed blended sources, which means that we just misattribute them and think that our friends said them and therefore they can be trusted. And this is just one of a great many cognitive biases that we have and are simply hacked by these, uh, by these deceptions to make us believe that they are true. Okay, so very easy to deceive and excellent successes, also very cheap. Uh, the Russians were previously using uh, over $100 million in order to buy um, American PR companies for them to lobby in Washington. And suddenly they realized that in only uh, tens of thousands of dollars, they could do this massive influence over millions of voters. And obviously, once, once you have that kind of superpower, they are going to be copycats. And indeed, the number of countries that have been using uh, computational propaganda has been on a very steep and very steady rise, 28 of them in 2017, all the way to 70 of them in 2019. If you look at a map of those countries that are engaged in this, those are the dark blue ones, they're basically covering the entire world. And as you can see, even Australia is part of this party and is, uh, or at least has been pushing uh, falsehoods through online mechanisms. Uh, specifically, Australia is not very good at it. Uh, and I only know of one example where it's verified that this is the case. I suspect a lot more, but uh, the one verified example is uh, uh, Tony Abbott had uh, uh, fake Twitter followers that, that boosted his, uh, his account. Okay, uh, you might at this point be interested to hear, so what political biases does Facebook have? And we'll talk about the, the US context. This is, this is the question that people keep asking me. And I really think that's the easy story, but I'm gonna tell it anyway. So bias, what is bias? Well, if you look at the Facebook demographic, it's very skewed in just about every dimension you can think of. People uh, yeah, on Facebook are skewed towards being um, young, female, highly educated, college degrees, and urban dwellers as, as four examples. So um, from the get-go, you have this skew. 
And politics correlates with everything, really everything. It even correlates with the weather. And um, it seriously does, by the way. And uh, in the case of the four dimensions that I just now listed, all four of Facebook's demographical skews, all of them correlate with a liberal leaning. So Facebook's demographics is to begin with skewed liberally. What does that mean? Well, what that means is an advantage to a conservative player wanting to push a um, voter suppression campaign, which as I said, is much easier to do than to boost uh, turnout. So what that means is if you had, um, I don't know, uh, had Trump and Biden both try to use exactly the same tricks. And let us uh, uh, suppose that the message that each of them has would have been equally uh, uh, conducive to, to, uh, to the kind of uh, uh, campaigns that, uh, uh, that Facebook uh, is, is good at, which is not the case, by the way. Um, it would still be the case that Trump would have an easier job because they would have a lot more people that they could influence with it. Okay, so from the beginning, everything is skewed, which makes it very, very difficult to analyze. And just to show you just how badly that is, in 2014, Facebook researchers did some studies about what news do people actually read on Facebook. And they realized that conservatives read pretty much an even balance of liberal and conservative news, whereas liberals read just almost entirely liberal news. And the question was, well, is this something that the uh, Facebook algorithm is doing? Sorry, hi Michael, can you hear me? Michael? We seem to have lost your audio. Can anyone hear me? No, you can hear me. Michael? <laughs> okay guys, hang on, Let's see what we can do. Your, Michael, your audio's turned off. Can you? Can't, no one can hear you. Can you hear me? Can you? Can you? Can you hear me? Right. No, we can't hear you. So your your audio's no. We, we can see you, but we can't hear you. It turned off about two minutes ago. <laughs> you, have you put yourself on mute accidentally okay now oh. now i can i can hear you again right you're back on thank you okay how how far back uh should i uh, backtrack it, it was this slide so maybe start again at this slide okay uh, it's about it's about it's only about a minute so okay that's a that's a big slide um uh, okay so very quickly the demographics in Facebook are skewed to begin with. Uh, Facebook is uh, skewed towards young people, um, females, um, urban dwellers, and uh, highly educated 
college degree people. Uh, that's that's a skew right there. And all of those things correlate with being liberal. So there's a demographic skew right there. And the sharing practices are also skewed because you have conservatives and liberals sharing in, in different rates, different types of, uh, of news, all of which makes it uh, to begin with very, very, uh, a, a very skewed environment where you don't really have a good definition of what bias means. When I'm talking about biases, I like to think about what are, the, what are the options that they had, that Facebook had, and what decisions they made. And I gave here the example um, where, where things really started to boil for Facebook, uh, which was that in May 2016, an ex-employee accused Facebook of using human editors to decide what is trending, mainly to editorialize what is trending, and um, that introduces skews because they had liberal biases in their, in their opinions. That these are people from San Francisco, you would expect that. And um, also they were inconsistent in their, in their decisions between person to person. And that is just as expected because, well, they're human. So Facebook uh, saw the public backlash and immediately fired that entire staff and replaced them by algorithms. And in retrospect, they probably didn't have any other choice. For one, they initially lied about uh, the trending feature, said that it was purely algorithmic, and that probably was the, the original sin here. And second, they are trying very, very hard to... Um, to, to, to avoid regulation in the US. And they only do that by saying, we don't editorialize, we are not a news provider, uh, we're just a platform. And of course they editorialize, doesn't really matter if they do it by an algorithm or, or by a person, but in terms of the legislature, the fact that uh, they, are, they were using it, people in order to do that, raised some red flags and increase the chance that uh, Facebook would, would be under regulations, which they, they couldn't afford. So they made this choice. And the problem is that every choice that you make has costs. And while having uh, human editors could uh, get you to some inconsistencies and some biases, not having them had other biases and other, other problems, specifically the uh, IRA bots, immediately pounced on this opportunity because the algorithms had much less understanding of what the context is and uh, what is true versus what is not true. And you could bombard the, uh, the network in order to make things artificially trending. And that's exactly what happened. Fake news immediately started trending. So all choices that you make are biased. And if you ask me the problem, the real root of the problem isn't that the choices are biased but the fact that Facebook ran experiments like the uh, voter megaphone experiment in 2010 and every other experiment ever since. And they're still doing it, by the way. Um, and when you run that kind of experiment and when you do your data science homework, what happens is that you know exactly where your choices are going to lead. That's the power of data science. And as a result, you can't just say that the choices are biased. The choices are intentionally biased. You made the choice knowing exactly which, in this case, political party was going to benefit from it. And that's the, the, the root of the problem. And that problem has no easy solution because it, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Every choice that you make is going to be biased. And when I said this, uh, when I published this in 2016, people told me that this is a very theoretical, very philosophical sort of concern. but um, in 2014, uh, Joel Kaplan was promoted to become VP Global Public Policy at Facebook, and he uh, demonstrated to the world that this is not a philosophical or theoretical concern. It's extremely practical. Uh, he was brought specifically for the reason that Facebook wanted to build better ties with uh, Republicans in DC, and um, he was doing his best to make Facebook more Republican friendly. And here are just three of the many, many, many things that he did in order to do that. So in 2016, there was a um, big public outcry about fake news after the uh, 2016 elections. And Facebook said, we're going to crack down on fake 
news and they built something called Project P, P for propaganda. And uh, Kaplan killed it. And he did that saying, we can't have it because it will disproportionately harm conservatives if we, if we remove all of that fake news. And he did that again and again, um, killing uh, projects because they would disproportionately harm conservatives or perceived to be. Uh, in 2017, when uh, Facebook wanted to make it uh, more about family and friends and less about advertisers, specifically uh, reducing advertisers that pushed fake content. And in 2018, when they had a project called Common Ground that uh, was intended to get people from different political views to um, converse in less hostile ways. Now, you might think, if you're a liberal, uh, that uh, Kaplan is saying that conservatives need fake news and uh, inciting violence and all of those things, um, and and, uh, and and he should have he should have taken all of those off the platform. If you're a Republican, if you're a conservative, you are equally outraged by the opposite decision, uh, saying, "But you know, doing it otherwise would have uh, hurt uh, free speech." And who is Facebook to start editorializing it? We haven't uh, voted for 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 Facebook, so. Either choice is perceived as a political choice, but for my money, the problem isn't with, uh, with that, but for, for the fact that he had to make a choice. It was either do this or do that. And either one of them had a political impact that could have been easily uh, foreseen. In the case of Kaplan, you, you can't fault him. He was brought in in order to uh, um, help the Republican friendliness. So uh, that is very much in keeping with his, with his job charter. Uh, but while I could I could delve into this uh, at great length, I, I just want to recap this entire story in uh, in really two quotes. The first is from 2014, around the time that uh, Kaplan got his job. This is Sheryl Sandberg, um, number two at Facebook, and uh, she was responding to people like Clay Johnson after the uh, emotion experiment, and she said, "Facebook would never try to control elections." rolling forward six years to today. And in 2020, Alex Stamos, a former ex-chief security officer at Facebook, says, I think Facebook is looking at their political advertising policies in explicitly partisan terms. Um, the Republicans in the DC office see themselves as a bulwark against the liberals in California. So basically what he's describing here is a war inside Facebook. You've got the liberals pushing a, uh, a liberal agenda, you've got the conservatives pushing a conservative agenda, and this has replaced um, democracy because in the end, whoever wins inside Facebook has huge power in terms of influencing election results uh, everywhere. Okay, that's an easy story. Everybody likes that story. Let's talk about the harder story, because I think this story, the easy story, doesn't really answer the tough questions. And here are some of my tough questions. If you think that Facebook's decisions are because of political expediency in the US, what about everything that happens outside of the US? Why are we seeing all of these things in Myanmar and Assam and South Sudan and Papua and Zimbabwe and in so many other places in the world. And it's always the same story. Facebook is being used by well-coordinated, well-funded bot campaigns in order to sow divisions inside a population, inject lies, incite violence, and ultimately cause genocide. And you might, you might say, Michael, you can't go on and, and, and accuse Facebook of these things. Uh, you have to let them uh, defend themselves. And the answer is, I'm not accusing them of these things. They are saying that that's what they did. Facebook had a, uh, a, a committee that they set up, independent committee in order to uh, inspect what uh, went on in Myanmar and Facebook's involvement in it. And that committee came back and said, yep, we did that. And uh, that was in 2018. And when you read today the, uh, uh, the responses from Facebook leadership, it's, it's appalling. In 2018, uh, about, about Myanmar, Facebook uh, executives say, 
okay, we dropped the ball on that one. We weren't, we weren't looking. We didn't know that we had this power. Um, we will do a lot better now. We will not let fake news uh, dominate our, uh, our, our net and we won't let uh, Facebook be used to sow divisions and we won't let it uh, uh, polarize people and incite violence. Well, they said that in 2018, you be the judge. Okay, so that's about political expedience um, because I don't see any reason why Mark Zuckerberg would want to support genocide in so many other places uh, in, in the world, in so many places in the world. So why, why is this happening if it's not political expedience? The second story that is being proposed as an easy solution is it's inevitable. That's just the nature of people and the nature of social media. Well, it, it isn't. There's been a recent study showing that if uh, you increase your time on Facebook, you become a lot more partisan polarized. Whereas if you increase your time on Reddit, you become even more moderate. If you increase your time on Twitter, surprisingly, no effect whatsoever. Furthermore, it matters what your leaning is because if you're a conservative, you're gonna be polarized by Facebook a whole lot more than if you're a liberal. So this is not inevitable. This is part of, of design choices in the making of Facebook. And uh, in this particular study, they go and uh, describe the various structural choices that make Facebook different to Reddit. But I want to go a bit deeper than just those uh, uh, surface structural choices. I want to go back to why they are there, why they look like they do. So who and what does Facebook optimize for is the question. And um, it's not really difficult to tell because you can look at their past history of what made them change policies and what didn't make them change policies. Here are things that didn't make them change policies. When the Facebook staff staged a virtual walkout, nothing was changed. When five board members left, um, and that happened in the year between mid 2019 and mid 2020, five board members left and policies didn't change because of this. So it's clearly not Facebook's staff that uh, Facebook is optimized for. Okay, here are things that made Facebook say, we'll do better and uh, occasionally make a, a point change. Bad PR and a public backlash. They basically waited them out and, and, uh, and went on with their life. A, a recent example is, um, there was a public backlash about the amount of negative posts about Greta Thunberg. And Facebook course corrected by saying, we will not allow bad posts about Greta Thunberg, but didn't extend that policy to anybody else, any, any group, it's just Thunberg herself. Okay, so it's definitely not the public. It's definitely not the users that Facebook is optimized for. And that probably is the core difference between that and, and Reddit say. But here are the things that did change Facebook policies. When politicians suspended advertising revenue, when they threatened regulations, and in, in mid 2020, this is the thing that caused Facebook to finally begin to fact check uh, politicians when uh, Unilever boycotted them. And after that, uh, many other um, um, companies pulled their, their advertising from Facebook. They had an 88% drop in share price. This was long after Twitter was, uh, was, was fact-checking. And by the way, to begin with, uh, Google and Twitter never allowed uh, hyper-targeting by, by uh, uh, political campaigns. So Facebook was to begin with more with higher exposure there. So this is, this is who Facebook optimizes for, the shareholders. And they see the direct link between ad revenue and share. So really it's becoming marketer friendly. And the North Star to maximize ad revenue, well, you want to maximize number of relevant users, time spent on Facebook by users, engagement of users with Facebook material, predictability of users' responses, and ease of swaying users. These are your North Stars. And Facebook is an extremely data-oriented organization. They've been extremely data-driven. And all of their choices throughout history have been targeted there to maximize these five. And they've been doing extremely well in those things. The problem is 
that you maximize them by creating a hyperpolarized environment. Zuckerberg himself recently noted that people simply engaged more with this kind of material. People engage more with inflammatory material and they spend more time uh, when, when that is the case and they get their, their friends to, to join the good fight. Obviously, when you're in a hyperpolarized environment, you're going to be a lot more predictable because your, your, your margin from other people is just uh, much larger. And the ease of swaying voters is maximal because, like I said, nothing makes a, a user more amenable than being scared. I think uh, Randall Monroe said it best. This is important. Someone is wrong on the internet. So we, we, we like to like but we really love to hate. We, we really love to fight all of the people who are against us. And if I was to uh, um, recap this whole thing in one slide, and I call this slide an unnecessary inflammatory slide pushing disputed content that will make this talk go viral, the whole story can be summarized as follows. Facebook has programmed an AI to maximize its revenue by large scale social engineering. The AI discovered that profits are maximal when the world is in flames, and the rest is history. Because when you have a, uh, a machine that gobbles up $50 billion in a year, uh, you, you, you really don't want to tinker with it. And the reason uh, why they would even more not want to tinker with it is because what built this machine is their strict adherence to being data-driven, so saying now, don't be as data-driven because it's not really great for society at large, just isn't in their DNA. And look, it's technology, you can't put it back in the bottle, but in other cases with other technologies, we uh, uh, in the end had regulation. And this goes back all the way to the uh, uh, industrial revolution. It's always the case that companies have different incentives than uh, people in society and regulation is what makes this thing work. But in this particular case, users can't push for regulation because they're completely addicted. Facebook won't because, of course, that's the whole thing. Um, and politicians, this is where it gets interesting because where we see really good regulation is where lobby groups are weak. Where we see uh, substandard regulation is where there are very strong lobby groups. In this particular case, there aren't any lobby groups. The politicians themselves are the lobby groups. They are the beneficiaries from Facebook being structured the way that it is. And so far, they've been playing this game and have not shown any interest in regulating any of it. And just to give you an idea of uh, how, how little um, power we have to, to regulate Facebook or, or to, to enact change in Facebook, remember the uh, Google Trends graph with a nice up curve and a nice down curve of uh, flat eartherism? Well, this particular Google trend graph showing a single spike is for the appearance of delete Facebook as a hashtag. And that became popular after the emotion experiment. There was a sudden spike, delete Facebook, immediately gone, immediately forgotten. And on that happy note, that's all I had for today. And the um, floor is open for questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Michael. That was awesome. So, as usual, very well researched talk. If you ever hear Michael talk, he really does the research, and this talk was just another example of that. Uh, we, we've got we're, we're at one thirty-six, so we're going to have a time, but we've got a few questions. So I'll, I'll jump in and say there'll be a questions about. There's a lot of uh, references in your slides. Will we'll limit part of the video is now on YouTube. Will the will the slides be available? Uh, is that a plan? I'm I'm happy to make them available. Yeah. Okay, so what I'll I'm say, happy to, everyone, in fact, uh, just 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 give out the entire uh, bibliography right. that I have in those slides. It's going to be uh, partial. Uh, obviously, my research went way beyond. I, I only uh, put like you know two or three uh, uh, links in in every slide. There's a whole lot more where that came from. Okay, so what I'll say, if on the meetup event page, there's like a discussion section. If you can, if you want to put them wherever online somewhere just just let everyone know uh where this material is available and i've already put the uh the link to the youtube video which is still going on uh in in the in the meetup chat 
So we have a few questions. I mean, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll carry on because people just drop out if they've got to go back to work. The lunch hour is finished, but I think we've got time. I've got about five minutes to, to answer a few questions. So can you see the questions, uh, Michael? I cannot. I cannot see the uh, questions. Let me. Let me just. Uh, there's a little. Just, but I, it's okay. I'll, I'll. I'll. Yeah. I think. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing. Yeah. If I can do that, maybe I can. I'll be able to see the chat. Yeah. Q and A. Uh, I see it now. Okay. So, Martin's asked quite a few. So I guess the first one is yeah. Uh, we, I think we've just covered that. Uh, have you published this material in an academic paper anywhere? Uh, I have not published an academic paper because I don't have any uh, uh, academic results of my own. Uh, yeah. This is just uh, stuff from other people's uh, uh, academic results. I did publish in uh, uh, the conversation um, one time in 2016 and one time uh, just earlier this year. Okay. And as we said earlier, Michael, post any 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 links to all this stuff on, on the Meetup site. Uh, it's another question from Martin. Have you done any analysis of how effective suppression techniques are within a compulsory voting system like Australia? For example, influences voters towards spoilt votes. I don't know that anybody's hmm. uh, done that analysis. I I, uh, I don't think that um, spoilt votes in Australia are enough in, in order for that to be an effective measure. In the US, the, uh, the suppression of votes is something that uh, they've, they've been doing since always. Um, the, the US is uh, structured so that, the US election system is structured so that it's uh, election is in, on a weekday, you don't have uh, a, a day off. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's quite costly for people to stand in line for hours in order to get to, uh, to voting booths, which is why in general, half the population doesn't do it. And uh, this election had an, uh, uh, an outstanding 60% voter turnout, which is the highest that ever was. Now, um, that again in itself is skewed. I mentioned before weather. If it rains on an election day, that gives a huge boost to Republicans because uh, the, 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 the working class urbanites who uh, uh, vote liberal tend to just not go voting because it, it rains. They can't afford it. Interesting. I, yeah, I didn't realize day of the week you have the election. Uh, On a Tuesday. Well, do, they, do they have uh, sausage sizzles in America? That's the important thing. That's the only reason I go. <laughs> uh, so... Another question from Martin, uh, no, sorry, from Ari, Ari Hunt. When most of the users are liberal inclined, then why is it easier for conservatives to influence suppressed voters? Shouldn't it be for liberals? Oh, no, 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 no. It's, it's, it's easier to promote, uh, to, to suppress voting than to promote voting. So um, if you've got a population and you're trying to convince them not to vote, your job is a lot easier. So you have all of these liberals. Uh, it's, it's highly, highly skewed towards liberals, uh, and they're they're just there, ready to be influenced. Whereas if you were a liberal, you would be trying to do that with conservatives, and you, there'd be less of them to influence. Or you would be trying to to boost liberals, in which case your job is harder. Awesome, thanks. So anonymous, how can we protect? Oh, should... sorry, that's my. That's my dog. <laughs> How can we protect against this type of political influence? Uh, do you want to take the questions, Michael? Sure. So how can we protect against this type of political influence? Ban politics on social media outright or in a defined period before an election is the question. Um, look, I think that it's not difficult to get regulation uh, uh, here if you, if you were inclined to do so. We, we, we've seen regulation against um, subliminal advertising, which is this is quite comparable to. We know that in uh, marketing, we regulate the whens and the hows. So for example, you're not gonna get 
in uh, your your Saturday morning cartoons for suddenly uh, advertisements for for kids stuff. Um, these these are places that we were able to regulate and we we're able to regulate successfully. And it's not difficult to find real news on social media or elsewhere. If you look, and there have been studies about this, if you look at any of the mainstream uh, news outlets, and when I say mainstream news outlets, I don't just mean CNN. Uh, Fox News is just as much of an example. They are by and large honest. They do not invent their news. This is not the same as what you're seeing from uh, deceptive uh, bot campaigns. So it's not difficult to separate, which is what I would have done, uh, the, um, the blended feed in order to tell people this is news and all of the rest is not news. And uh, then you can start um, regulating the news because the news then becomes uh, comparable with you know s standard editorial processes and you do have regulation on newspapers I mean if you look at what newspapers looked like before there were regulations in the times of you know Randolph Hearst uh, they they were the worst kind of tabloids and we just have regulation that protects uh, population now not difficult to do the problem is that nobody wants to do it politicians are right now reaping the benefits of uh, uh, hacking democracy. And I'm, I'm afraid that right now, uh, a democracy is in a very steep, very serious decline all over the world because of this. Okay, thanks, Michael. I think what we'll do, we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up there. We're getting a, a lot of comments in the chat that everyone really loved that talk. And it was, I think it was pretty fantastic. So many thanks again, Michael. And will you promise you one thing? You'll come and, do another presentation next year because <laughs> because they're, they're, well, they're awesome thank you and, thank and, you very much for inviting uh, me and i i always uh, love to uh, come. And, and hopefully uh we can have uh we'll see you in the flesh hopefully next year so hopefully. With that, okay with that i'd like to say thank you again to michael thanks for everyone for coming uh have a great this is our last event of the year have a great break have a good rest uh, and we'll see you all again uh in 2021, hopefully. Thanks a lot, Michael. And thanks everyone. And don't forget to wash your hands and stay safe and wear a mask. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks and bye all. Okay, thanks. I think hopefully Felipe will stop the, stop the, stop the meeting now.